Hello and welcome to NewsClick's show, Mapping Fault Lines, where we discuss major geopolitical issues from around the world. Today, our focus is going to be on the Persian Gulf region, specifically on Iran, where the United States has imposed fresh rounds of sanctions. Now, there were two rounds of sanctions imposed in the last week alone. One was against certain officials of the Defense Department, of the nuclear program, and the U.S. also said that all existing U.N. sanctions would be reimposed. And more recently, there was another round imposed on certain officials citing so-called human rights violations. And we have with us Prabir Prakash to talk about this. Prabir, so we've, we've discussed this issue before, of course, but uh, the, the U.S. has imposed the sanctions despite the fact that obviously even its conventional allies have said that it has no right to do so. Secondly, the fact that there is no global framework for it to impose any of these sanctions because it's not even a part, a part of this thing. So are we just seeing, say, an escalate or some rhetoric ahead of the presidential elections where Donald Trump wants to make a point or is this something that is more systemic and likely to continue? You see, first thing is, of course, when you talk about American sanctions, there are two class of sanctions. One which U.S. imposes unilaterally, and they have a huge number of those sanctions that they have imposed unilaterally without really any authority from any international body, including the United Nations Security Council. So those are the kind of sanctions anyway that the U.S. has been imposing. We are not talking about those sanctions in this particular instance. What we are talking about is the Pompey's claim or the U.S. claim that the United Nations Security Council sanctions are now operating and a snapback has occurred. The snapback is that US, Iran violated certain conditions of the treaty, which is what we've already talked about earlier, in which a nuclear agreement was arrived at. Iran actually dismantled its, a lot of its uh, centrifuges as well as sent abroad, exported, in fact, the fissile material, or not the fissile material, as much as the enriched uranium that it had uh, collected. And the enrichment was up to 20%. So certainly it was not weapons grade, but that was sent outside. So they had fulfilled the major part of the agreement very quickly. In fact, that was a surprise for all of us that it was done so quickly by Iran, and therefore they had entered a phase where things were supposedly to go back to normal, and slowly all the sanctions on them would be lifted. But the snapback sanctions uh, would have happened if Iran had violated any of the agreement, and then if the Security Council did not give them any relief, then the snapback would automatically take place, was the way the agreement had been framed. So effectively, any country could veto the lifting of the sanctions if a snapback occurred. That was the whole purpose of this convoluted way it was phrased. So the US, though it's no longer a party to the agreement, now claims that it has the right to invoke snapback sanctions, though it's not a party, and no country in the, in the, in the whole uh, agreement, the other parties, which is, of course, Germany, France, UK, Russia, China, and also the European Union, apart from the United States. None of them have said that they agree with the United States. They do not agree. They would like to keep the agreement going. And the US is no longer a party. In spite of that, the US believes that they can actually, quote unquote, have the snap back in operation. So Pompey is not saying that the US is imposing sanctions. It is saying it is implementing the snapback of the sanctions, which is what the United Security Council would automatically have to accept because after all, they have not passed a resolution relaxing this condition. Therefore, automatic snapback has taken place according to Pompey, not according to the United Nations Security Council or any of the other members, including the United Nations uh, administrative apparatus, the Secretary General and others. So they have said, we believe that now snapback has occurred. 
Therefore, under UN Security Council resolution, we have the right to even stop ships carrying equipment which are under the sanctions list. And therefore, we have the right to board ships. This, this kind of rights that they are claiming means that it is possible they will stop Iranian ships, cargo ships. For instance, if you remember the Iranian cargo ships, the tankers carried oil to Venezuela. Yes. They can now claim that under UN sanctions, they will now stop such shipments. They can search Iranian ships. These are the powers that they're claiming. So whether they do anything or not, the powers they're claiming seems to be quite dangerous. Okay. Now, why would the US claim such powers and would they do something? Now, what people will do is almost impossible to figure out. But why are they claiming this? And as you rightly said, this is really Trump's election is stand now that he wants uh, vaccines to be started to del be delivered by 1st November, preferably late October, even if the vaccines have not passed through all the safety trials. He would like the some saber rattling in the Persian Gulf to take place in Iran. Now, if he does stop his ships, a couple of ships, what does Iran do? That's the key question. And can they can it then spiral into something far more dangerous? So, what is a could possibly be a election grandstanding? Unfortunately, has dangers far beyond the grandstanding. And these are the kind of dangerous situations, if it really goes out of hand, we are likely to see a disaster in the Persian Gulf and disaster for particularly for countries like India, which depend on Persian Gulf oil. So, you know, in that sense, I don't see why the world is so quiescent, not bothered about what's happening and letting it be something as if it's a bilateral issue between Iran and US only. Exactly. And uh, that's an interesting point because while the U.S. allies, the, country, the other countries which did sign uh, the agreement, have made some noises, there has not been any kind of sustained attempt to sort of uh, take the opposition to the next level. It's just been uh, murmurs of protest. And the, it's interesting also because last month, a couple of months ago, when one of the Iranian ships was coming, a, a suit was filed in a U.S. court to seize it. And now there's even more possibilities for that. But in this context, what are the Iranian options really in terms of uh, responses? There's, we've discussed this, of course, when Qasem Soleimani was assassinated, there were later issues with sanctions also. So right now, given the geopolitical situation, what is Iran's options? You know, Iran has always played a very deep and long-term game. They have not reacted quickly. They have not provided any... Uh, visible provocations that the United States can, can easily uh, do something about. They have, they have really played what is called the deep Persian game. Mm -hmm. After all, the Persians had their, uh, not their empire, but they had diplomatic uh, sway over a very large region. And that large region included even Central Asia and South Asia. So this, this, this kind of cultural uh, politics that Persia has, Iran inherits, is a much older and a deeper one. So they have been relatively sophisticated with the way they have reacted to all the provocations that the US has done. And it's been a very calibrated response they have done. They didn't walk out of the, for instance, the agreement that we are talking about, right. the uh, Iran agreement. That, that they didn't walk out of. They said, if you don't do A, then we will do B. And that was actually within the framework of the agreement itself. So all the countries till now accept that Iran has not really broken the agreement. So that has been their tactic. So what will they do here? If physically their ships are stopped, I don't think there is any option. They will have to retaliate in some form or the other militarily. It will be a military confrontation that will take place. Now, what is the, the way the military confrontation will take place? What will be the nature of that? That's an open question. If you remember, when uh, General Soleimani was killed, they retaliated. They retaliated against American bases in Iraq. Now, that retaliation was of a nature that actually the US did not then want to take it any further. 
So essentially, the retaliation took place, but was did not cross a threshold by which U.S. should have got involved further. Right. So what is the is there a threshold here? If you stop a ship, will you fire a couple of missiles? If you fire a couple of missiles, if they retaliate, then will you fire more missiles? So this is the escalatory ladder that exists. That if you stop an Iranian ship, if you board an Iranian ship, which the U.S might conceivably do, right. claiming they're imposing United Nations Security Council sanctions. Then what the response of the Iranians would be very difficult at this moment to say. But the question is, once you're on this escalatory ladder, no country individually, both these countries individually, will find it difficult then to stop where they want. So it's not in their hands anymore. So if they stop a ship, what will Iran do? If the Iran then threatens it with some, say, missile boats, frigates, light, lighter uh, navy, which they have, which are quite fast moving, carrying missiles, if they then send it over there, what will the Americans do? If they threaten but don't do anything, will the Americans back off? If the Americans don't back off, will a couple of missiles be fired? So all of it is really up, up in the air. The point is that this is not a minor issue that if such an escalatory step is taken, then I think we are in very, very dangerous times. And as you said rightly, I'm shocked at the fact that the world is sort of letting it go, that they think this, to me, it seems, seems like we are now like ostriches. We don't want to see the brutal truth. The United States wants to withdraw from nuclear agreements. We don't want to face the truth. The US is virtually saying on the salt, uh, the new start too, that there is really no time, and we don't want this uh, path, you know, this kind of agreement. We want a much more comprehensive agreement, or nothing at all. So you can't have a comprehensive agreement in five months. So nothing at all. It becomes the basically the way to go. Iran on the Iran issue also, the way they are be, uh, placing themselves at the moment, they're not leaving any room for, uh, shall we say, an agreement or something which Iran can agree to. That's not the intention. The intention is not get, okay, that we made a mistake, we pulled out of the agreement, we haven't got anything. Now let's see whether we can, both sides can say face and want something. What they're asking is unilateral disarmament, which is something which Iran cannot agree to right. because Gaddafi did show that unilateral disarmament can mean later the violation of that agreement and of course intervention. So that's, that's how the Libyan uh, government was overthrown and Gaddafi killed. So the, everybody has learned that lesson. They don't trust the Americans what they say. Therefore, nobody is going to give up military uh, weapons that they possess. In this case, what they're being asked to is to dismantle their entire missile system. That it's not, not, not the question of nuclear issue. Nuclear is only the excuse. The real demand is Stop your missile development, actually destroy your missiles. That's the one which is going to come. That you cannot have missiles beyond, say, 250 kilometers, 300 kilometers range. And then you cannot intervene in other countries. You must stop your intervention in Syria, right. uh, Lebanon, and other places, which means essentially you must let these countries become our vassal states. So that is the picture they are, they are basically laying down before Iran. So this is essentially disarming Iran, A, hemming it in, B, and C, for like, uh, priming it up for a later overthrow. So that's right. not something that any government is going to accept. Right. So I think that's the issue over here. This has been building up for, up for quite some time. But, you know, Trump did not perhaps want to go the full military route because he also is risk averse, that he makes all these noises, but he has been risk averse. But what happens is when your elections are nearing and you have a, you're really not in a good position, then you start thinking, okay, let us take some risks. If I win the election, then we will see. So this is where we are at. They have, for the first time, we have uh, aircraft carriers back in Persian Gulf. We didn't have it for the last, I think, 10 months. It does not just one person, uh, it's not one aircraft carrier. It's also other vessels which are there. They're also, of course, and as you know, an aircraft carrier is equivalent to a floating island. Right. So it has 
uh, of course, a lot of aircraft. It's, it's a really a huge force projection. Correct. So this force projection back in the Straits of Hormuz, just before the elections, and the fact that Pompeo is making all these noises about snapping back of sanctions, I think we are in a much more dangerous position than we realize. And you know, as I always have said, we can predict larger forces. Okay. We, are, we are talking really of two people, at, it seems, uh, Pompeo and uh, Trump. Pompeo believes in the rapture, that if a certain set of events takes place, then of course, you know, all the believers will be lifted up in the heaven. So he doesn't have too much of a worry on Armageddon, it seems, okay? It seems it might be that Armageddon might actually be uh, useful to him uh, in a very personal sense. Yeah. That's what, uh, at least that's what the public response to his uh, evangelical uh, position has been. And of course, we have Trump, who doesn't believe in anything except the fact that he wants to be president again. So with this, we are at very dangerous, we are in a very dangerous state, mainly because we have unpredictable individuals. We don't seem to see that much of checks and balances in the US anymore. Right. And uh, therefore, trusting the United States not to do something foolhardy, which can precipitate a war, which can precipitate a very dangerous situation, is something we can't really talk about. You know, the, my, as I said, okay, we can understand what's happening in the United States. Uh, there's really uh, where the United States is going on. Lots of issues are really extremely dangerous, yeah. extremely, to our understanding, extremely foolish. The way they have dealt with the pandemic, not that we have dealt with it much better. But what surprises me is if such a war breaks out in the Persian Gulf, Straits of Hormuz then will cease to exist as a transit uh, corridor. Exactly. So what happens to the entire oil that has to come out of Persian Gulf areas, which might be under pandemic is not that important, but already transport has started picking up. Air, airlines will start operating increasingly. So what happens to all of that? Without oil, the global economy ceases up. And at least for South Asia, Southeast Asia and East Asia, it's going to be a disaster. What is the calculation that the US has, we don't know. Similarly, if that happens also for Europe, it's a disaster. Is it their understanding that let all the other continents go to the dogs? At least the US is safe because after all, we have shale oil, which can again continue to pump out. The prices will go up. So we are okay. Is that the understanding? I really have no idea about this, honestly, because I think we are faced with an irrational order which now with the United States has become. So what we are seeing is a rogue state, which is really under uh, nobody's control. And international agreements, international bodies no longer seem to have any tempering effect on, these, uh, on, on this player, the United States. And it seems to be believing that it can live by its own rules, while every other country has to obey two sets of rules. One is international law and other is US law or whatever US says is the law. So this is the situation we are in today. Absolutely. And it's interesting you mentioned that because this week saw the 75th anniversary commemorations of the United Nations General Assembly. There was an, And the key theme was multilateralism, which leaders across the world stressed on. Some of them even took digs at the US. But there probably hasn't been any time in in the history of the UN when multilateralism has been so completely uh, the, thrown to the wind, so to speak. Yes, yes, I think that's an interesting point that we are talking about multilateralism in an age where multilateralism has virtually ceased to exist. All the multilateral agreements, particularly in arms control, have been now dismantled. When we talk about any of these issues, whatever agreements have been raised, reached, they have been dismantled, Iran agreement being another one. Then if we look at trade agreements, even the World Trade Organization, which actually benefited the US and the European Union considerably. Right. Now the US says it doesn't fulfill its purposes, therefore it's not willing to uh, let the dispute tribunal work, which means WTO is effectively defunct. Right. Then we have seen the trade and tech war. We are basically seeing the unraveling of the internet 
because all the technologies which underline it were interoperable. They will no longer see, they will no longer be so, because that's what the US, US has started talking about. So all of this is a major turning point in the world. And I don't think we are really prepared or the global uh, citizens or the global intellectual uh, bodies are equipped to analyze that this is something which is uh, qualitatively different from what we have seen earlier. And this is the United States facing its weakening over the global system, particularly what it had after the Second World War, now deciding that naked power is how it will shore up its economy, its international position. And that is, I think, increasingly what we are likely to see. And that's why multilateralism may be what in the United Nations discusses, but that's not something which is on the American agenda at the moment. Absolutely. Thank you so much Prem, for talking to us. That's all we have time for today. Keep watching News